continue looking at Paul in a preliminary way. And uh, I refer you to page 249 of your textbook where there's a, a little sidebar called Theology and Ethics. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of the word theology, but for our purposes, just think of uh, doctrine or teachings or what's true about God. And then, I don't know what you think of when you think of ethics, but ethics is just uh, how you live. You know, and you can have all kinds of beliefs about God over here, and then you can have uh, a totally different life over here. Or um, you can have a messed up theology and a messed up life too. Or some people have pretty messed up theology, but, but they have pretty good lives. You know, they're, they're pretty good moral people, but you know, what they believe about God is, according to the Bible, it's, it's not very good or true at all. But what I want to say about Paul here is that Paul stresses both theology truths about God, and in particular, how through the gospel, God's character, because you know we're made in his image anyway, but then sin mars that image, but through the gospel, we rediscover the glory of God and the goodness of God. And we become his children, and we begin to grow in godliness, godlikeness. And so things like faith, hope, and love, the gospel brings those things into our lives. And you've probably been around somebody in life that was a good influence on you. At least I hope you have been. Uh, sometimes our parents are very good influences on us, or our grandparents can be very good influences on us. They love us, and we respond, and it elevates us. And that's one of the ways the gospel works, is that God comes to us by his word, and uh, we're born again, we're renewed spiritually, and the love of God, Paul says in Romans 5, is, is poured out in our lives by the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. So that's all theological things, and then how that changes us, and then it changes how we live. And that's the right-hand side of this column, The Importance of Good Works. And this book, as, as a matter of course, this, book's, this book quotes the NIV. But here I've had to change the NIV a little bit because the NIV in these verses in Titus uh, translates what the Greek uh, says is good works, kala or agatha erga um, in Greek. It, it, it translates it as uh, what is good, which is pretty vague. So, for example, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. Well, what's that? But in the Bible, if we talk about good works, well, now, that's a lot more definite because there are a lot of commands given in the Bible, and it talks about works, and it says you can't be saved by your works. But it says if you know God, you will be zealous for good works. And that's what 314, for example, says. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing good works. 38, to devote themselves to doing good works. Uh, devote there could also be translated be zealous for. Maybe the NIV didn't want us to be zealots. So it said, uh, um, devote yourself to doing what is good. But that sounds really philosophical. And Paul's not being philosophical here. You know, he, is, he has a zeal because of what he thinks is theologically true. And if you look at the net effect of these verses on the right side of that box, the picture you get is of a people who as a whole, you know, they, uh, they really are straining to do good things. You know, you don't have to like, find them and drag them out and kick them in the rear and say, okay, do something good. No. Christians are people that are looking for a chance 
to reach out. They're looking for a chance to help others. And they're looking for ways that they can be of service. For, uh, for many Christians, that begins in prayer and daily devotion to God. Because what good are you out there as a social reformer if you're a godless person? Furthermore, uh, the biggest worker of things good in the world is God. And through our prayers, we enlist the help of Almighty God in all kinds of ways, seen and unseen. So that's kind of where it starts. But I, I just say this because uh, in Paul, it's easy to get involved with, okay, what does he teach about justification? And what does he teach about forgiveness? What does he teach about, you know, teach, 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 doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. And to forget, all of this has an application. And the application of Christian theology is seen in marriages, it's seen in friendships, it's seen in how we operate at work, <laughs> um, how do we treat people that we're around, you know, at the airport if we're traveling, or at the filling station if we're gassing up, or if we're a teacher, how do we treat our kids and why? Now, a Christian will have a different motivation. And they'll be zealous for doing good by those kids in ways that a non-Christian, they're not going to think the same way, and they're not going to act the same way for the same reasons. So to summarize, on page 251, I won't read these 14 points, but that's a summary of Paul's life and theology for purposes of this uh, particular course. And if I had to single one out, it would be number 10. The cross is the means and central symbol of the redemption that Christ won. I mean, Paul taught about men and women. That's not the center of what Paul was about. Um, he taught about lots of practical issues. That, 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 that's important. But Paul's not primarily an ethicist because he doesn't believe people are saved by good behavior. Uh, Paul, in the end, is a preacher of the cross, and he also is a, a man who lived the cross. And just as Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, deny yourself and follow me. That's not all Jesus said. But it's central. If you want to follow Jesus uh, and you want a, a, an easy, pleasant life, you got a problem. Because Jesus didn't call you to live an easy, pleasant, self-indulgent life. we got, we got lots of people. They're, they're after that from Jesus. And they're going to bend. They're going to bend religion, so that's what it sounds like it's about. But that's not what Jesus is about. And I, I recall that there's a place where he upbraided some people, and he said, you know something? You go everywhere trying to make disciples, and when you get disciples, they're twice the sons of hell that you are. <laughs> you know, and we have a lot of people who are out peddling things in the name of Jesus, and it's all for their benefit. It's a win-win, and it's for my benefit, too, as a minister who peddles it, because if I get a big following, then, you know, my ratings are good, and I can buy fuel for my jet plane and everything, and uh, it's, a, it's a great ministry. But, but it's a false ministry. And Paul, from the, when he was still blinded, you know, he got blinded on the road to Damascus. And there were three days when he's like, I wonder what's next. <laughs> and behind the scenes, Jesus has found a guy named Ananias, and he says, go tell Paul, X, Y, and Z. And Ananias, remember, he, he says, now wait a minute, wait a minute, God. <laughs> this guy's a dangerous person. He's arresting Christians. But he said, I'm not going to go talk to him. You go talk to him. <laughs> and finally, God, he hears out uh, Ananias, and then he says, go! <laughs> I mean, the, the volume's not turned up in, in Acts, but if you read that, you, you can see. He, he listens to, to his excuses, and then he says, go, for he is a chosen servant of mine, for I will show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. 
That's kind of where Paul starts out. And then at the end of his first missionary journey, I'm reviewing Acts now. At the end of his first missionary journey, at the end of Acts 14, he kind of sums up his journey. He says, we've seen we must suffer many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. So um, this all goes back to how our salvation was won. It was won when Jesus went to the cross for our sins. And the cross is the central symbol of Christianity. And I, I, I know a lot of people, they, they don't get what it means. Because, you know, you can buy sterling si silver crosses, and you can buy St. George crosses, and you can buy Byzantine crosses. And, you know, there's a big industry worldwide in sterling silver and 24 carat and 18 carat and gold inlaid and jade. And, I, you know, there's a lot of money to be made off crosses. But Jesus came to die for our sins. I mean, he taught. Uh, the incarnation is important. A lot of things that are true about Jesus, but the real goal of his coming, the way that he undid what Adam and Eve did, was by dying for our sins. And that's why Paul is a preacher of the cross. And that's why we'll see one of Paul's life verses is found in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, and it's when he says, uh, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep of slaughter. And he quote, he's quoting a psalm there. Because David, David saw that side of being people of God too. Being people of God in a hostile world is not always pleasant. Because the world is always trying to exterminate the people of God, directly or indirectly. So, I mean, the resurrection, we wouldn't have a, a, a positive message of the cross without the resurrection. A number 12, uh, the church, very important. But you're not saved by the church. You're also not saved by believing in the resurrection. If you try to get around that, try to get around the cross. That's very popular today. In fact, when I was in Chicago, this is probably 10 years ago now, there was a story in the Chicago Tribune about how churches had a ritual that they were getting rid of their crosses. Because, you know, they said, when we have people come into our sanctuaries and they see that cross, oh, that's, a, that's negative. You know, it's about sin and guilt. We want to be positive. And so let's just preach the resurrection. Let's get rid of that negativity. But Jesus came preaching repentance. You've got to come to grips with the issue God has with you. God has an issue with us. We've broken his law. And he wants to forgive us, but he can't forgive us if we're in denial. So when we own up to our issue and our transgression, God can deal with us. You say, we agree. Now, I have done something to deal with your guilt, and it is the cross. And when people come to God in their guilt and understand that Christ died for their sins, whew, takes off. And it can take off because Jesus rose from the dead. That's how we know that um, God accepted the sacrifice of his son for human sins. Uh, at the top of page two of your handout, I just have the, I think, about 12 issues that I boil down the, the major topics in Paul's letters to. And you could read those on your own time, and I hope you'll find uh, those chapters or those, uh, those issues um, illuminating and, and informing. Any question about Lecture 1, which we're almost uh, done with time for Lecture 2, but that's okay. We'll catch up. It speaks in here of ethics. What about morals? Are they the same or are they slightly different? Uh, Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, they, they overlap, but um, morality, I think, is, is more uh, fundamental to behavior. Also, it's more, uh, it's more informal. Um, and I'm using ethics as sort of pulse formal teaching about how Christians should live. I've always thought of it as sort of a defense of the right to have a message. Okay. 
Okay. And um, I would agree we have a, a moral consciousness. Um, people are made in God's image. Actually, if, if you ever read C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, he has a little appendix there. And he uh, writes about world literatures. And what you find in world literature, Chinese and Western and Norse, uh, what you find that is c a common moral code across cultures, across millennia. You know, there are certain things that you don't do. And, uh, you know, none of these groups had the Bible or had Moses, but it, it you know, his point was uh, man is a moral being. He has a sense of right and wrong, and you don't need the Bible to prove that. You, c you can get it from, really, from anthropology. All right, um, for Galatians, I'm, I'm largely leaving you to the textbook. Um, I will remind you that Acts 13 and 14 are the best commentary there is on the book of Galatians. Because Acts 13 and 14, are it, it's an account of the first missionary journey. And for two years, Paul and Barnabas are planting churches in a region of what's now central Turkey. And if you look at a map of the Roman world, that area was called Galatia. Now, it was, uh, also, there was an area there that was Phrygia also, but, but primarily is Galatia. And so the way that this textbook is written, there, there are actually two theories. It's, there's a North Galatian view and a South Galatian view, and the book talks about that. But taking the South Galatian view, Paul and Barnabas founded many churches over a two-year period in Acts 13 and 14. And then at the end of that period, they went back to the sending church, which was in Antioch, Syrian Antioch. And then apparently, once Paul got there, he found out that some of the Galatian churches were defecting. And so he wrote Galatians to sort of uh, give them a little slap in the face. And he says, I'm surprised that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. Not Paul, but God. And they're going for another gospel, which is really not another gospel. There's only one gospel. So that's what gives rise to Galatians. And, and if you want to know, you know some of the struggles that the Galatians faced, then read Acts 13 and 14, because it talks about the tensions between the pagan population and Paul and Barnabas, and uh, the synagogue, or the synagogues that Paul preached in. The longest sermon we have from Paul to a, uh, you could say, a worshiping audience is in Acts 13. He preaches a long sermon to a synagogue. And uh, if the uh, effect you get at the end is they don't buy it. They don't buy it. And so he says, okay, I'm going to take it to the Gentiles then. So uh, that gives us important information on the tension in this region between the people that accepted Jesus as the Messiah and the, uh, the native Jewish population who did not uh, think that this was a good thing and apparently moved in after Paul and tried to dissuade people from standing by the gospel that Paul gave them. Maybe like some of you, when you became a Christian, if you weren't in a family that understood Christianity that way, uh, sometimes your family will try to dissuade you, either by giving you the boot or by um, raising certain disincentives and saying, you know, if you continue this way, then X, Y, and Z is going to happen. We won't come to your wedding, for example. Um, I, I married someone who, when I married her, she was still a, a good Roman Catholic person, and there were people who would not come to the wedding because of that, because they didn't agree with uh, uh, what she was doing. So we need another five-minute break, and so I'll see you in five minutes.